to a few people uh, that are sort of working now, but not a lot of them. I'm and uh, he, um, he was its he was one of the people who worked in it, and then he was also one of the people who began the first innovations that made comics, uh, comic books, different from newspaper strips. And, um, and uh, in, in the early days, of course, uh, oh, why don't we say this? <laughs> Are you, uh, I'm rolling. Okay. Well, let's continue talking about Will Eisner for, for, for briefly then. In what way um, did he um, um, uh, make comic books different from comic books? Well, first he came in as, a, uh, as someone who was selling, and um, he quickly organized. In other words, comic books originally were... Sunday pages from the newspaper syndicates reduced in size so that they could, uh, and they were reprinted, and they were reprinted four pages of each feature uh, per issue. And in no time at all, the, each syndicate had its own comic books. But people saw that there was some money to be made, and they began to supply some material, tear sheets, in effect original art, that wasn't from the newspapers, but would be an imitation of the newspaper Sunday strip. So all of the early uh, contributors of original art imitated the Sunday pages. And of course they imitated um, mostly the, uh, the, the popular favorites of the day, whatever they were. And, uh, but after a while, with 64 pages for a dime, it became clear to some people that they could lengthen the stories, not do four pages, just like the newspaper syndicate comic books, but they could lengthen them to six, and maybe even lengthen them to eight, and um, Eisner was one of the prime movers there and um, bringing a degree of original personality to the material. Comics is built totally on idiosyncratic effort. And so he brought a, a lot of raw art which was idiosyncratic, if only because it was so raw. But he brought it into a situation where uh, uh, the longer lengths began to have some value for the reader. Ultimately, comic books started to feature 12-page stories. And ultimately, I must say that uh, I was one of the first to produce a comic book that featured an entire comic book with a single story for the entire length of the book. But those were just some of the possibilities, you know, that were uh, apparent in comic books that uh, people like uh, Eisner and some others explored. And, um, uh, and as a matter of fact, when the war came, the, change, the lack of change in comic book material simply suggested how once something is successful, there is no possibility of it ever changing because once something is successful, it sets up a format where the publishers are absolutely rigid <laughs> and against any change in that format. So that by and large, the comics of the 30s continued to a great extent into being the comics of the 80s and ultimately into the 90s. The big difference being that starting in the 80s, there were major technological changes. And um, the technological changes uh, affected um, first by degrees the price. So a 10 cent comic book will now sell for 
an average of two, two and a half dollars, where it used to be 64 pages, it's now only 32 pages. However, there are now comic books that sell for $9 or $10. They have a spine. They're um, uh, trade paperbacks. And as a matter of fact, there are even hardcover collections of comics, some original and mostly reprint that sell for $40 and $50 a crack. So the entire business is changing and uh, as the audience d diminishes, it seems that the only way that they can maintain their publishing situation is not only to charge more, but um, to get whatever advertising there is and turn out as many comic books as possible. For instance, in the early days, a publisher might publish seven or eight, or in the case of the most successful, something like 13 or 15 comic books per month. It's now possible for them to turn out 100 books a month. They do it now because in some instances, they're lucky enough to have advertisers and they have to guarantee those advertisers a circulation for their ad. So they have to make sure that they turn out, they print enough books to cover their advertising guarantee. You understand? So as a result of that, they make money. Of course, what's also happened is that in the interim, the technological changes include television and animation, which have absorbed all of the comic books special qualities which comic books had alone during the 30s and into the 40s and now you see them everywhere there are movies that are adapted from comic books that look like comic books there are animation things that look like there are toys by the billions that are adapted from comic book characters and the comic book character and the the meaning and the value of the comic book character is everywhere. It's no longer, you know, to be found in a 10 cent comic book by itself. It's everywhere. In fact, it's so everywhere that even comic book lettering is used in advertising. The pow and the bam and everything else. So that it's been so thoroughly assimilated that there's hardly any reason for its existence, except one. And that is, the only value to anything is if it has an idiosyncratic singular quality, not to be duplicated. But that suggests a different way of running the business than it's being run. The way it's being run is that a pattern has been set and unless something can absolutely prove that it can improve on that pattern, they're not yielding. Well, of course, one of the ways you improve a pattern is that there has to be a certain amount of freedom, a certain amount of creation, freedom in creation, so that idiosyncratic personalities aren't stemmed or held in check. In other words, you as long as they have to pass the filter of an institutional sort of situation, there are not going to be any changes. So all the changes are technological. So comic books look, they, they're magnificent in terms of their production values. They, they reproduce painting, line, value, quality of, of almost any kind. It's incredible. They look just like animated movies or they look just like real movies. The color effects they get are sometimes fantastic, but the essentially the material is the same. In all that time, the material hasn't changed. It's still pulp material. And of course, there's an argument to be made. The argument is that pulp material is popular entertainment. If it wasn't for pulp material, there wouldn't have been any 30s and 40s movies. In fact, there wouldn't be any movies today that are weren't uh, and aren't based essentially on pulp material.
escape literature, uh, all of that, the, the shoot 'em ups and the, the most popular material is escape material, the, the uh, pulp material, and most of the heroes during the 30s were essentially prototypes of pulp heroes. People like Gable and Flynn and so on and so forth. So the thing is that uh, while everyone argues that comic books haven't changed, you figure, well, if they did change, would anyone read them? <laughs> I mean, they buy them for some of the qualities they have now. And the other thing is that when writers become good enough to raise the level of the pulp material to a point where it's clearly superior, they're superior. They leave the ranks of comics and they simply go to the ranks of higher paid creative writers like films and television and, uh, you know, uh, novels or whatever. And they don't have anyone standing over them. They don't have that sort of uh, essentially working within such a tight context that the publisher really dictates in what you do. And uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, and plus the fact, as I say, that with all of the values of comics already assimilated in so many ways, it seems hard to, uh, to uh, realize how they're going to, you know, survive beyond the, uh, the millennium. Because uh, the, very, the very things they need to survive are the very things that are being uh, denied, and that is... Uh, the ability to freely create and interpret and to encourage that idiosyncratic quality that creates distinct personalities in comic strips, whether they're newspapers, whether they're comic books. You have to have, that's, that, that's the value of good work. And uh, if you're only looking at uh, handcrafts, up to a point it's, they're interesting, then after a point uh, they're not. And um, so I think that's where they're at. You want to ask your first question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, well, that actually answered like a lot of questions I had. What about um, what about the possibility of smaller, like self-publishing, and with new technologies allowing self-publishing, well, a chance of, for the idiosyncratic artist to? Yeah. Well, uh, you're right. Self-publishing is the answer. The only trouble is that self-publishing is one thing. Distribution is another thing. Distribution is in the hands of large corporate personalities and, you know, companies. And um, they are, in effect, they're in alliance, and it makes sense. The distribution company has to depend on its biggest customers in order to stay in business. So they'll favor the big companies in every way just to sustain themselves. So that, uh, and distribution is very hard. So uh, it's not possible, it's rarely possible for self-publishing, which is done by the hundreds, uh, by the hundreds every month, obviously by very young people mostly. And, uh, but the point is, uh, they can't get through uh, primarily because um, the distribution won't uh, allow them. Of course, the, the publishers aren't going to involve themselves in a situation where they set up their own competition, you know, <laughs> and, and in effect, uh, you know, keep them going. It's just that uh, somehow or other, in the old days, in newspaper strips, there were... I don't know, uh, say maybe a dozen syndicates, newspaper syndicates, that were um, extensions of uh, the newspapers themselves. And they bought features, and they bought writers, and they bought comic strips and so forth. And um, they distributed them, if they were lucky, on a worldwide basis. And uh, that worked for a long time. And uh, it still works today, but it it favors comic strips less. First, because newspapers um, are, are always 
resist using comic strips because of the space. They'd rather give it over to advertising and they have to pay for their comic strips. And um, a comic strip, I've never known or ever heard of situations in newspapers where newspaper people ever spoke with respect about comic strips. I mean, uh, essentially, it's a, it's an, a natural antagonism that exists there. But they had a system, you know, that worked. It, it, it's working less because uh, the less the, they are, they've reduced the amount of space that a comic strip can have, which means that they've eliminated entirely realistically drawn strips like Terry and the Pirates and so on and so forth, who obviously need a certain amount of space in order to uh, you know, uh, demonstrate their wares. And they, what they do is they buy strips that are drawn in the most, you know, uh, uh, primitive or in the simplest possible style so that uh, no matter how much it's reduced, uh, you know, they, 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 they find that it, they think it's still legible. But um, I think that it simply suggests the disintegration of even that system and, the, and their values, are like comic book values, they're all, always being absorbed. I mean, the situation in comedies and so on and so forth, which are based uh, to a great extent on the rhythm and the quality of uh, newspaper uh, comic strips are, um, uh, you know, are in direct competition with them. It's so hard to sustain an interest they print about uh, 20 comic strips, 30, 25 comic strips a day, and uh, possibly people follow one or two out of the 25, if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to take, I know we noticed the air conditioner came on again, do you want to take a break? It seems to me, at, that, at this point, the most convenient way to get information in any case, you know, so, uh, uh, I just think that, that print is going through a very bad time, and I think that only, uh, and, 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 and it's endless duplication. At one time, the country was made up, when I was in the army during World War II, guys were made, came from all over the country, and every place they came from had its own industry. <laughs> it was known for something, it, you know, they made shoes, they made cars, they made something, they made, they had, you know, no, the, the, the country has no, you know, industrialization. I mean, uh, they don't make steel, they don't make anything. Uh, uh, Detroit doesn't, uh, is, isn't what it used to be. And, uh, and one paper, it's like the reason that television can be successful is that a nightly television program can reach every home in America and give them the information they want to read, except for possibly what happened at their local grocery store that day. <laughs> Why would you need, you know, local papers which simply duplicate international news, national news, but, and have to get it off a, uh, you know, a, um, uh, an AP wire or something like that. I mean, they can, um, one, it's, it's possible for the New York Times now to be published all over the country and give people, you know, the kind of information by the kind of writers that uh, they would never get locally. And then, you know, to have a, uh, a small section left over for their own local news, their own local ads. But uh, it, that seems to be where it's all going to head. Why? It's like when these companies buy each other out. The first thing that happens is 25,000 employees get fired <laughs> because they don't need the duplication. They got machines that'll just set up another copy, you know, and immediately eliminate the need for uh, separate tellers, separate banks, separate buildings, separate this, separate that. So um, it just seems to me that uh, that's what's happening in printing. And the only thing that survives that is something singular and idiosyncratic, something, in other words, a, a, a creation that reflects, reflects distinct personalities that, uh, you know, will involve people. And um, I think it's harder to do than most people think, but uh, nevertheless, it seems to me that that's the only basis for survival
for, um, uh, for something like comics. Um, I think at one time children's books might have been in trouble. All of a sudden they brought a range over a period of a generation, maybe two generations, a, peri a group of writers who were unique. I mean, first of all, they were of their time and they wrote and, and they absolutely caught the moment and while it may not have lasted beyond the moment, it caught the moment for a six-year-old, for a seven-year-old, for a three-year-old. And it seems to me that children's books are exactly what comic books ought to be, and that is to have some creator submit something, you know, that uh, represents, uh, say, uh, you know, uh, uh, an effort that uh, people might find, you know, unique and interesting and singular. I, I, I think um, uh, in a field like children's books where you know what kind of book it is, that, that must be hard to do, but they do it regularly. Do you think that's what comics used to be? Comics, at one point, were very much... When I was a kid reading comics, the earliest comic books, they were a ref reflection of newspaper comics. So there were sports comics, there were cowboy comics, there were, I mean, all together, there were humor comics, there were, you know, science fiction things, and they all intermixed, and you had an, an endless variety of things. And generally, they were done by creators whose work reflected their passion. In other words, <laughs> you've got guys who drew Western stories, who'd been drawing Western stories all their lives, and somehow brought a, a degree of passion and authenticity, and somehow, you know, an involvement with the material that merely assigning an illustrator won't do. And uh, so, again, it comes down to having works that are so, in those early days, you could find anything. There was a sports strip called Ned Brandt. There was a newspaper uh, writer named Jane uh, Arden. She was a, uh, um, a reporter. There, there was, there was a, a knight named Okie Dokes who was brilliantly drawn. Uh, there was Little Orphan Nanny, which was, I thought, a brilliant strip. There was Dick Tracy, which I thought captured the 30 better than anything except the Jimmy Cagney movie. <laughs> Dick Tracy during the 30s was a miracle. It just had the whole urgency and it reflected the fascination with gangsters and so on and so forth. It was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and of course, uh, because it was all starting then, so, you know, Flash Gordon seemed like a revelation. And, and of course, uh, almost anything you could think of, they all seemed absolutely wonderful because they were uh, original and they were reflections of their creators. And since that time, by and large, it's all been homogenized. Why not? Why have seven strips when you can do six imitations of the most successful strip? I mean, it seems to me that's what thinking is like now. It's, it's hard to be original, it's hard to run a business and not duplicate yourself and not imitate your, you know, your, your greatest successes. It's hard to avoid patterns. I would imagine in the first films that were made, the minute that Griffith or somebody else discovered some way to make the film more cohesive, bingo. That was it. <laughs> that became how you made a movie up to that point until somebody else added another element that made a significant difference. And, uh, and nobody challenged the, uh, you know, the, the format once it became successful and grew. I, I remember reading uh, how people resisted to getting sound. People were saying, you're spoiling the medium, you're, you're doing whatever, you know, but, um, what I'm saying is that uh, clearly there are changes being made all of the time.
and uh, we're changed by uh, the changes. And um, I used to think it depended upon, you know, individuals, but I see now that technology comes in and just creates possibilities that are immediately exploited and that becomes the new culture, whatever it is. And that most things that happen on a year-to-year -year basis it are, it is the bringing forward of that culture by simply adding what's new that year. In other words, I think it keeps moving and changing all of the time and the guys who are on top of it manage to keep including it into what they're doing and that keeps making the change. In other words, comic books are not what they were in the 30s. There are changes. <coughs> it's uh, the changes are in speech and in characterization and so forth and so on. But by and large, they're still offering essentially the same material. But you can see the changes of the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Uh, I mean, a whole company was formed during the 60s, Marvel was able to exploit some of the student activity during the 60s and incorporate it into their comic books, into Spider-Man and Fantastic Four and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden they became, they outdid the biggest company going, which wasn't able to make the change and didn't recognize what was going on. And as a result, they were surpassed and they became, a, you know, a, uh, in comics at least, a secondary company. But it was somebody being aware of just the changes of language and attitude and irreverence that marked their books deliberately that were excluded from uh, DC, say, simply because they were absolutely deaf to, well, blind to the change. I mean, whatever the change was, they could sort of like see it on one side, but professionally it had no place in their lives. So my feeling is, you know, there are always changes, those changes that simply mark the moment in which we live, in which we exist. And the guys who are on top of it or who are sensitive to it manage to include it, and that makes a slight difference in the level and quality of the work. But in terms of, you know, real change, like organic change, structural change, it, it, you know, um, it, it doesn't matter much if guys are, if people aren't allowed to be idiosyncratic in a field that has to run on schedules, that, uh, you know, uh, must come out on time, that, uh, where um, there are editors appointed to uh, guidepost, you know, the, uh, the material down certain particular pathways. Um, and that's the way any big business works. I mean, it keeps, it hires people and it channels their efforts in what they think is the most profitable way. It's just that uh, usually the people who channel the efforts are not creative and generally don't, uh, they, they don't make those idiosyncratic changes. They don't have the kind, the fact they have the kind of personalities that they hired for. Stable, steady going, you know, uh, being able to control things, keep things under control, management. Whatever management means, it doesn't mean idiosyncratic. So it's like, you have to be, either as they have as there are occasionally visionary editors who are essentially themselves creative people who are picked plucked out of the field into positions of authority and they have a vision that either helps the field go forward well Eisner was one was one guy like that uh, Harvey Kurtzman was another especially Harvey, I think, was another like that. He brought with him ideas 
that affected the, uh, the structure of the field. In fact, uh, I thought that uh, Kurtzman ultimately turned out uh, what were probably the best comic books ever produced. And um, in fact, he ultimately turned out mad, which um, uh, it was, a, was the most successful thing he turned out. But uh, my own tastes run to some of the other things he did. Uh, but as I say, uh, that's what you have to have. Uh, you, and of course, uh, somebody like Harvey, what do you think happened? To, Harvey had to leave the firm. He, uh, it, was, it was too hard for him to work under a, manage, uh, a management situation which held him in check until finally he bridled against it and left. It's so, I mean, it's, it's a situation that goes on all the time. I just I mean to say that in comics, it goes on all the time too. And up to this point, I would say primarily management wins because in the early days, when it was only important to get the material out on the stand in order for it to sell, <laughs> uh, anything went. Guys wrote their whole personality out in their strips on a monthly basis. As the books clearly became large profit-making situations, the publishers took more and more control of the creative effort. And uh, until they institutionalized the material, and once institutionalized, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure, you know, how anything changes. Technology at this point is the only thing that looks like it's going to change it by eliminating it. That's interesting because um, I, just in my own um, sense of things, it seems that comic books went through uh, more uh, creative changes and innovation between, say, 1938 and 1965 than they have from 65 to the present. It seems to, it seems to be changing. In which way did you, do you feel that there, there were changes? Um, just the, um, um, for instance, the uh, from 1945, uh, the superhero genre and the way it was, the look of comics, and they seem to, they, if you look at comics from say 19, mid-1950s, they have a very different look. They were oh, they modernized uh, oh, oh. drastically, but, but not by technology, but in style. Oh yes, but that's what I'm saying. They, well, all they did was reflect the concerns of the day. What happened was, with the end of the war, the superhero died. And uh, even though they tried, by 1947, they were practically all out of business except for Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman. And uh, do you know what came in? Perry Como came in. What I'm saying is that people wanted to go back to a normal life. Drawing became very representational, where it was idiosyncratic and full of personality because it was about uh, fantasy. All of a sudden, it began to look like advertising illustration and people were using models and the, the, the most popular strips were just strips where people uh, were contemporary strips. In fact, the most popular features of the day were the romance books. And uh, in fact, they were successful to the point where they outsold everything else in comic books for a number of years. And it was full, I mean, they were totally reflecting the kind of Eisenhower, Perry Como values that were, that people wanted. People wanted some sort of, you know, decorum, stability, predictability in their lives, and everything reflected it. As a matter of fact, at one point uh, during that period, the Kefauver Committee came in, and uh, the, uh, what was the name of that psychiatrist? If worth a ride came in with you know this this garbage this junk about comic books and so on and fo so forth I mean it was simply incredible a federal investigation when they still had uh, the Klan and a million things running around the country that were real threats and so on and so forth they're talking about comic books and uh, and it, it got to the point where I was doing action comics at the time. And I was restricted to a point where I, nobody could throw a punch. Mm 
in a 12-page story. I finally managed to get a panel, squeeze in a panel where the Green Lantern or somebody threw a punch. But that's how severe it was. That's how concerned they formed their own comics code, you know, to like a Cattlemen's Protective Association to make sure that uh, nobody, you know, uh, stepped outside and brought more headaches to comics than they already had. But uh, essentially, all I did was reflect the time. I'm, uh, I've, I was an artist before I went into the army in 1942 and 1943. In 44 and 45, I was in the army. When I came out, I started to work again. I was the same artist, I had the same values, I had the same instructions from my publishers, I had the same restraints from my publishers. All they did was simply adapt to the times. During the 50s, they did look, they were more representational. They started to license television programs and radio programs. Mr. District Attorney became a comic book. I Love Lucy became a comic book. Toby Gillis became a comic book. Jerry Lewis became a comic book. You understand? They just took, all they did was, since they could no longer use uh, superheroes because they were too violent, they just went for what everybody else went for. And that was the thing. If there were any changes in comic books at all, it was simply, if they were lucky, they reflected the time in which they were in. I'm not sure that you were even born yet, but at one point during the 50s, television went nuts. There must have been three zillion Western TV shows. Everybody was in a Western. Everybody. And it was, naturally, comics converted to Westerns. So what I'm saying is that comics were just a regular reflection, but with the same pulp material. I mean, they would be inspired by something and they might change their style, but the content essentially was the same. It, 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 it never was anything more than sort of entertaining junk. But it was hard work. I'm telling I, all my life I've worked as a comic book artist. I was not a natural artist. I had to learn everything from perspective to picture making to anatomy. It's been a lifelong dedication. I work, I work longer hours and harder than almost anybody I know in my family or amongst my friends. And the same thing is true for some of the writers, even though they never wrote great things. They had to write within certain constraints and patterns, whatever they were, in order to fit and satisfy the tastes, you know, of the publisher. And uh, it might have been a little easier than drawing, but drawing in comics has been a in fact. Every lesson I ever learned in my life, I learned from having to learn how to draw. I mean, uh, I, I had to learn, in order to learn about drawing and anatomy, I started to read, I, I, I started to follow uh, painting and sculpture. I did everything humanly possible. It was the only real education I ever had. But it was that intense that to this day, I mean, uh, I haven't taken you into my studio. but. I, got thousands of books in there. And um, what I'm saying is that uh, despite the fact that we've turned out sort of an unimportant product or whatever it is, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, I feel inadequate saying, here, I've given my whole life's effort to it, so I don't, and I've, I mean, I've tried to make a living at it all these years, and I've always tried to do good work. And yet I don't think, you know, that it ever, all that work ever really came to much. <laughs> Didn't mean much. You know, it, uh, it, it was just an exercise in working in a certain area. It reminds me of some of the guys who worked in advertising or who did magazine illustrations. Some of them were really supreme. 
I mean, but not from a point of being meaningful. You know, <laughs> they, they take a guy like Norman Rockwell, who is, is say, the most popular illustrator in the, who ever lived in the United States, and they're still debating whether there was anything worthwhile in his stuff at all, you know, whether it was just a bunch of hallmark foolishness. Well, how do you feel, like, I will, um, do you think the comic books had a, um, an influence on, on children uh, as they read them? In a sense, throughout the 20th century, just about everybody today grew up reading comic books. They must have had an effect on our sensibility, on our visual literacy. You know what I found? That the people who were most involved, most intensely involved with comic books, you know, they all became writers and artists. <laughs> and wouldn't it be perfectly natural for them to be that? And I find that that's true about almost anything. I mean, the comics isn't about cutting people up. It's about creating. In fact, even Frederick Wortham withdrew all of his charges and said ultimately, towards the end of his life, that comic books and comic book fandom was an enormously, you know, creative and positive good that it gave, the, that all of the kids involved, it gave them purpose, perspective, so on and so forth. It was a beginning. I myself was not terribly disciplined when I was a kid. Whatever discipline I got, I got from learning to sit and to steadily work at something in order to achieve an end. And I must tell you, that in itself is, is like the hardest lesson I ever learned, and I think it's the hardest lesson most people learn. And the first thing that comics does is if it's a passion, what do they think they're gonna do? Get a bunch of child molesters, and rapists, and knife wielders, and pistol shooters who read comics? No, they're gonna get writers and artists. That's what they're going to get, and that's what they got. There seems to be, like you, you said before, like a tremendous influence on other media from comics. Yeah, because the, movies. Right, because they explore, you know, the most primal pulp values. I mean, uh, in movies they wouldn't have guys jumping around with a cape and everything until it was okayed, until it was so successful in comics that they were, you know, they dared to do it. But, uh, I mean... Uh, uh, all of the great uh, movies of the 30s were written by pulp writers, by Sabatini, by, um, oh, there was a guy who used to write uh, most of the, the gangster movies, or a lot of them anyhow, I, I, his name slips right by. But um, they wrote most of the films, I mean, most of the, uh, the you know, the, the entertainment, there were some writers who were, uh, you know, who wrote uh, material that wasn't pulp-based, uh, but uh, I would say that most of them had to have a hand in pulp-based material. I don't see, because every studio depended on both pulp-based material in order to stay in business. Occasionally they would turn out a movie, like the Frank Capra movies or uh, some of the John Ford movies that simply transcended you know, the limits of pulp and so on and so forth. But uh, that was it. it, it transcended, it wasn't typical. What was typical was, you know, rich, enjoyable uh, pulp material enhanced by pulp personalities. And uh, uh, I think, uh, and that's what, uh, what comic offered for a while, and it, and it was the only one to offer it. There were, you know, there was no, uh, Comics ate up the pulps. When comics started to come out, they were so popular that very often the same publisher who published pulps published comics, found that the difference in circulation was so great, they dropped the pulps. And comics, in effect, took over as their prime source uh, you know, of, uh, of income and publication. And uh, the, the fact is that, uh, as I say, uh, there wasn't any competition. Uh, maybe radio, but even radio, I mean, they had, what was on radio? Why, Flash Gordon, Tarzan, Skippy, Jack. Little Orphan Annie, 
Jack Armstrong. You know, I mean, um, the Lone Ranger. So what I'm saying is it was, it was a world in which you only had a couple of choices. Everybody was happy with their choice. Now you have, you know, the same values, but you have like a million ways of pursuing them. You have dolls and movies and tapes and records and CDs and, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's so endless. Uh, you, you, you can go into a place like Toys R Us. If you don't go berserk in a place like Toys R Us, you won't go berserk anywhere. I mean, the whole idea that there could be six zillion dolls up there, each one, you know, somewhat adjusted, somewhat different, all appealing to the same audience, all trying, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's really remarkable. So it just, it's just that comics, uh, you know, it's like they've reached the point where the technology is, as I say, uh, is, is old fashioned, their values have been assimilated. There's hardly anything that uh, <coughs> they can do now except to be singular in order to sustain themselves. Whether they can manage to be singular, and it's hard being singular. I know a lot of people who try to be singular all of the time. And in the same way that it's hard to write an excellent book, it's hard to do an excellent piece of anything. So, uh, you know, that's why it's so hard to turn this business over and set it on a new track. Excellence by itself is so goddamn hard to pursue that, uh, you know, it's a miracle. And if one guy, uh, uh, Mouse, won the Pulitzer Prize, so it suggests that a a big little book, a comic book, is capable of winning a Pulitzer Prize. But where's the next mouse? I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's simply uh, not that goddamn easy to do, and especially because it's a singular effort. But that's the way it should be done. It should be done like a mouse. It should be done with a passion and intellectual vigor and with the quirkiness of the... Uh, of the creator, you know, steadily pushing it forward. But, uh, you know. It's hard in the current environment. Yeah, yeah um, at, at any time, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you made a connection, well, a number of connections between um, comics and movies. They seem to have a certain similar birth. And um, I had not actually thought about that before, but the movies relied on pulps a lot, too, just as comics did. And, right. Um, do you think there that there's other um, uh, like sort of other similarities between? Do you think comics and movies sort of grew up together? That uh, cutting and and angles also reflect panel structure and angles in comics. Um, As actually, it, it does because when I was a kid and Citizen Kane came out, that's all we talked about was Citizen Kane. I don't know where, you know, I mean, um, they say it finally got into a situation where it became a successful film, that is, it made money. But it was, n nobody talked about anything else in the business except C Citizen Kane. We talked about the angles and the photography and the quality of drama and so forth. So, I mean, clearly it had an enormous impact on us. And uh, you don't even have to go that far. Right from the beginning, Will Eisner's work reflected, uh, you know, the uh, uh, film, and Harvey Kurtzman was the prime exemplar of a guy who utilized film technique in order to do comics. He wrote for it. He, he the whole rhythm of his comic strip drawing was intended for it, and it read like a movie. It was uh, absolutely beautiful stuff. Do you think comics are also similar, uh, like the movies are such a collaborative art, there's no yes. single person involved, right. sort of, right. is that true for comics too? I mean, Yeah, I think it's more and more, as uh, in the early days when they had stuff like Happy Hooligan and some guy can wander in from a two martini lunch and sit down and, you know, draw his daily feature and nobody would really be able to tell whether he was zonked or not. 
what I'm saying is that uh, I, I think it's past that point. I, I, right now, there's an enormous amount of pressure on the quality of product. So, you know, I think it's very, very hard uh, um, not to turn out a, uh, uh, you know, a piece of work that's up to the level of, in fact, that's one of the problems, is that the level, the, the level of the best is what everybody tries for, and in some ways they manage to achieve the level of the best but not in all of the ways that are necessary. So in other words, uh, maybe you'll see some art that's remarkable for its quality. And I mean remarkable. Uh, and uh, you, you, you'll see it, you know, periodically there are people who rise in the business who lead the business. They're so good that they're heads and shoulders above everybody else. That means that everybody else is just a step or so below them, that means they're pretty good too. It's just that they're not, not up to the level of, uh, you know, of that uh, other person. You know who Ella Fitzgerald was? Yes. So they said about Ella Fitzgerald that she was the best. There was no second place. <laughs> well, I think in most cases there, are, there is a second place. I think that uh, with the exception of Ella, that there's always a second place. People who are just sensational, but, you know, not, well, I won't, let me eliminate the word sensational. People who are really just very, very good and just haven't got that quality or element in their work that would make them remarkable. And, uh, but you know, I mean, there has to be something for, for achieving a level of craftsmanship. You know, that's worth something too. And, uh, but, um, um, you know, I've forgotten the, uh, your original question. Oh, the co collaboration. <laughs> oh yeah, so I think now that it sometimes takes collaboration in order to achieve an effort. In other words, you can get it from one person, say, whose whole heart and soul are wrapped up in what they do, but who don't have the capacity. After all, comics calls for writing and drawing. It calls for a kind of double mastery, which each in itself would be considered, if you manage to achieve it, would be considered, a, you know, like a, to be excellent in either of those qualities, considered a tour de force, but to, to, to have it together it's as hard there as it would be anywhere else. There was a, uh, an artist like Milton Kniff, who was remarkable. Do you ever see that Calvin and Hobbes? I thought that Calvin and Hobbes was remarkable. I just, I thought it was one of the best things I ever saw in my life. And uh, uh, years ago when, uh, when Peanuts started, I thought that uh, that was, you know, remarkable. And um, to be able to write and to draw, and not only did they draw, uh, as simple as Peanuts was, it was beautifully drawn. Calvin and Hobbes, to me, was like a museum piece. I thought it was so brilliantly drawn, I couldn't even think that this guy is also capable of writing. And to have him turn out to be the most remarkable kind of writer as well. <sighs> That to me is unbelievable. Harvey Kurtzman was a writer artist. Now, I don't believe that Harvey was at the level of the guy who wrote Calvin and Hobbes, but, I, but Harvey's achievement was tremendous, as was uh, Eisner's in the early days. And uh, I think it's, uh, I think just being a, an excellent craftsman is hard enough to go over the top and achieve Calvin and Hobbes or any of the great strips for their particular qualities. Uh, what was the name of that strip about the, um, the, uh, the ant and the pussycat? Uh, Harriman's strip. Oh, a crazy cat? Crazy cat. I mean, it, it took such a 
quality of distinct personality to achieve that. I mean, nobody was able to achieve it after he left. There was no possibility of carrying on that feature. And uh, uh, those triumphs are rare. It's, it's rare enough just to get first-rate work. To, to triumph that way is, is, is a miracle. So sometimes, uh, yeah, like some, I guess um, some collaborative Oh yeah, so a collaborative effort. It, it definitely, it, you know, if it, it if it would really, uh, you know, if you it's sympathetic. But then, you know, uh, I know I'm a big fan of uh, of uh, popular music, uh, show music particularly, and uh, I mean the collaboration between, say, Ira Gershwin and his brother. It was perfect. Yeah. I'm thinking of the collaboration, say, between uh, the pencils. And the That's not a collaboration. No? No. That is, the penciler should be doing all the inking. The inker is simply somebody who is created by the publisher, in effect, to make sure the books go out on schedule. The inker, it's not that they don't sometimes bring something to the work, but what they bring to it is a change from what the pencils originally were. No matter how subtle, no matter how, don't you want to see the work as it was originally created and intended? And the artist should have the responsibility of inking his own work. And if he's incapable of inking, then he shouldn't be given the work. In other words, he should be responsible for a finished piece of work. And uh, an inker is simply a, uh, a made-up job. And uh, it's not that they're without skill. In fact, a lot of inkers become pencilers. And sometimes, occasionally, uh, some pencilers become inkers. But essentially, they are parasite jobs. So that was sort of part of the publishing company. To me, the collaboration. Assembly line production. That's right? part of this action. That's the perfect word, mm -hmm. assembly. The assembly line thing, the collaboration is between the writer and the artist. That's the real collaboration, because uh, what the inker does, the penciler can do. What the writer does, he may not be able to do. And, uh, um, I, I, and, and as the stuff becomes more complex, comic strips used to be three or four panels a day in the daily newspaper. Uh, it was six days a week, and maybe, if you're lucky, a Sunday page as well. Then it got to be a 12-page story. Then it got to be a whole book of 20, usually an average of about 23 pages. Sometimes, you know, they would work out to longer than that. But I suspect it's going to go way beyond that. I believe that, like, I believe they'll be open-ended, like any novel finishing when it reaches its, you know, its intended, its, its natural uh, end. And uh, so, um, uh, as a result, um, I see that uh, uh, it won't be possible for most people to give themselves over to a book that might uh, take six months or a year or maybe more to do. It's too complex an undertaking. In Europe, they turn out albums, and their albums have a different mood than ours. They, they're, they're, their mood is of, of mature films, even though they may reduce the comic book in quality to a thinner, you know, more juvenile version intentionally or unintentionally, the fact is that their inspiration comes from more mature subject matter, usually, than American comics. And uh, the thing is that, uh, uh, and they have a, a lot of collaboration because their drawings are very, very sophisticated. In fact, as I say, it uh, sometimes takes these guys a year to do an entire book. Their books don't come out on a monthly basis, though. They come out like a regular book, and they stay in print for as long as they sell. Mm 
So that a book and a character like Tantan, which was, as I remember, amongst the most popular, it was the most popular for a while, um, maybe in its like 200th printing or something, of Hergé, who was the creator, of a, became a multimillionaire. I mean, as with anybody who managed to sell the number of copies that he managed to sell. I believe that's the way those books should be sold. I believe that's the way comic books should be sold. And, uh, and I think that uh, they should be sold, if possible, out of regular bookstores. Do you think that's the future? I think it's the future because uh, if, if either there's no future because comic book stores are dwindling in number and converting into uh, carrying uh, all sorts of accessory equipment. You understand? Uh, they, they carry posters, and they carry this, and they carry that, and they carry a, a number of other things that keep them going. They carry games. And uh, so um, that um, uh, I believe that uh, um, it's just hard. As a matter of fact, if one publisher, DC, ever stop publication, that would be the end of the uh, comic book business through, um, you know, uh, through the comic book stores that sell the magazines now. Because without product, they'd have to close. And DC turns out most of the product at this point. So um, uh, I think that, uh, first of all, also, store, comic books are not economically viable. There's just so much you can charge for a magazine, which comes out on a monthly basis, which is a pain. And books sell. Nowadays, you go in, you buy an average book, it goes anywhere from 20 to $30 for an average book. <laughs> I, if you got any kind of a sale, you got a living. I mean, and on top of that, if the book is popular, it can stay on sale forever in eighth, ninth, tenth printings, whatever, which is, seems to me is the way a piece of creative work should, uh, you know, should exist. Comic books is, uh, are, are made to be disposed of. They can't even list, last past their last month. They're out of date with their last month. It seems to me everything is turned against comic books. Just the frequency of publication so that somehow it's like with Little Off and Annie or something. After 60 years, they have exhausted, I don't know if it's still running or not, but I would assume that they have exhausted every single possibility that that character had, you know? And uh, I mean, unless they're, uh, depending on a, on a brand new audience to grow up, you know, never having seen it, then becoming rap. But generally, most strips reflect the time in which they were created. Orphan Annie reflected the 30s, the Depression. It was brilliant and wonderful. And up until the time its original creator died, it had a certain voice, it had something to say. But it, it's like Death of a Salesman. Death of a Salesman came out somewhere around the, the end of the 40s but it's clearly a depression area play. Its whole di psychology depends on your knowing what the 30s were like and what it's like, you know, to get kicked out of a job or something. And most of these trips, like Dick Tracy, I mean, Dick Tracy was wonderful during the 30s, absolutely wonderful. But once you hit the 50s with it, in my view, it became tortured, a, a, a sort of a grotesque strip where they would have to create grotesque characters in order to stay in business. But, you know, that, I mean, that's everything. But usually things move forward, you know, I mean, because they can, and when they can't, they drop out. It's the end of them. It's like uh, the silence. I would, I'm assuming a lot of people wanted to continue with the silence. It was a real art form.
that uh, the sound was contamination and corruption and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, <laughs> who would go to see it? So, uh, you know, I mean, it had reached its time, it had reached its end, and uh, some technological innovation had made it a brand new medium and uh, with a different style of acting, a different style of script, a uh, different kind of uh, direction, everything. And um, I, I assume that, that comics were like the newspapers of the 20s and 30s. I mean, you must know about what newspaper life was like in big cities during the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. It was the bloodline of the city People who worked on newspapers had <coughs> the jobs that were just, you know, the most satisfying kind of jobs in, in so many ways, you know. And because it's what, where everything was going on. It's where all the information was. It was what, where every, if you had to know anything, it was, it was there. And uh, I, there was, um, I used to read Ben Hecht. Who, used to, who wrote the front page. And uh, he used to write about uh, the 30s and the 40s and his experience, you know, and it was simply a remarkable period, a remarkable period. Um, do you want to take a little break for a while? Sure, why not? Okay. I still want to ask some questions. Uh, I want to talk about you. But that's because we're trained to be craftsmen. We're not trained to be artists who do meaningful work. It's like the guys who painted all those years for uh, Saturday Post. I mean, some of them were absolute wizards as painters, watercolors, oils. I mean, they really could paint. But in order to achieve art, you either have to be do that work at a, such a high level that it's you know clearly obvious, or you have to be able to integrate that stuff with a point of view that makes it singular. But you know, I mean, most of those guys just stayed illustrators with all of their skills and their ability as a painter. Hardly any of them ever rose to the point where they were gallery people. I mean, they may have been exhibited, but what I'm saying is they never made it the way, um, what's his name? Uh, Campbell soup can. Oh, yeah, I mean there was a whole raft of guys bringing in these new ideas, these new points of view, and uh, they all became, they were all, uh, you know, uh, not only gallery painters, but uh, you know, I mean, they became, they represented modern art, and uh, they represented it because that's it's what they dealt in. I think that's, the, that's what I was trying to say through this whole thing. Essentially, if you buy into a hand, like in a card game, essentially those are the cards you're going to play. To think that you're going to rise from one level to another, it has to be a miracle. I mean, you, you, you just have to be shot out of a cannon. You need enough force and propulsion <laughs> to break the jet barrier in order to make that kind of a difference in your work. Of course, you have to have the capacity for it. But what I'm saying is, even with the capacity, you need that kind of propulsion in order to get away from the hand that you dealt with and the cards you're used to playing with into a new situation. And uh, I've never, in comic book art, I mean, I've seen some stuff that I think approached it. There was a strip called Polly and Her Pals by an artist named Cliff Sterrett. That was a Sunday page, I don't know if it ran as a daily, that employed all the techniques of modern art in color and everything in the Sunday pages. It's often been singled out. The pages were beautiful. I myself wouldn't know whether it qualifies as high art. I know Lionel Fenninger did a comic strip, but when he did a comic strip, I don't think that what he did as a, in a comic strip was, you know, is what 
would be considered high art. I've never seen high art in comic books. The only thing that I could see as coming out of comic books is essentially that narrative drive that's worth a certain amount of respect. It's the narrative drive that keeps pulps alive. It's that narrative drive, you know, that people are always rushing to one way or another. That's the thing that keeps them coming back. And uh, the fact that they managed to put it into comics and uh, make them acceptable and uh, successful, I think, was remarkable. I mean, you know, you have to take a long view also. And, uh, but generally speaking, I mean, uh, I, I, I think that high art is high art and what we do is something else. It's work full of craftsmanship. And to me, that seems enough. Well, um, we, uh, let's talk about, can we talk about, about you for a while? Sure. Okay. Um, um, I just, just have some, sort of start out with some general questions, if you don't mind. No, um, well, by all means. Going back to, uh, to um, how you first got started. Well, uh, I was a kid. <laughs> I uh, once, I had a great time when I was a kid growing up. We were poor as hell. I mean, we were terribly poor. We lived in a cold water flat. We had no heat. We used to have to gather broken wooden boxes and newspapers in order to set the, cold, the stove that we had in the kitchen in order to set a fire on it so my mother could cook on it. But. Life was fun. I mean, as a kid, I was all I ever did was run and jump and play Lone Ranger. And I mean, I once thought people have asked me to write something. I always thought about a, a title for my book, and I thought my book would be called Huckleberry Cats because <laughs> it just seemed to be perfect. I it was a a perfect depression product. Uh, I grew up during the Depression. Everything great seemed to be developing during the Depression. I mean, <clears throat> I we were poor, but everybody else was sort of poor too. And um, I mean, everything was happening. Flash Gordon and Tarzan and Buck Rogers and comic strips with color were coming out and movies with sound, radio with serials and uh, programming of all sorts, jazz started with, well, swing started somewhere around the mid-1930s. And by uh, 1940, I was 14 years old and I was listening to Betty and to uh, Artie Shaw and to Duke Ellington and to Count Basie. And I was watching Cagney and uh, and Flynn and Gable and Cary Grant and Fred Astaire in just the best movies ever made. And, uh, and I, I was simply re a reflection of all of that. I didn't know whether to, to dance or whether to, to walk to a drawing board or whether to do any. I wanted to do everything all at once. I was so influenced by everything I saw and heard and, uh, and, and everything was happening, everything was erupting. And uh, so it was, it was a brilliant period, you know, as, as I say, to grow up in, despite the fact that we were impoverished and it was a struggle day by day. And, uh, but uh, what a time it was. So those were all kinds of... Yeah. And we came over when my grandfather died in the end of 1929. And we got here something like six weeks after the stock market crash. So, I mean, while I have some memory, I'm not even sure whether it is I have a memory or whether my mother told me these stories, and I sort of visualized them in my mind so that I think I remember them. But, you know, I do remember a couple of traumatic things about life in Europe. And uh, 
And I remember, you know, rub, running up to the rail when we came into New York Harbor and they saw the Statue of Liberty. But my whole life, you know, has been uh, here. And uh, um, as I say, I went into the Army when I, in 44, 45. And um, uh, uh, in fact, I was one with all of the movements. When uh, Levitt started to put up housing on uh, Long Island, ultimately when I married, I didn't move into a Levitt house, but I did move into what way they called split levels, which were blooming all over the area. And whatever was happening, I was a reflection of what was happening. When did you start drawing? Started drawing. Uh, I once saw a kid in class do a head of Popeye. And I asked him to show me how he did it. He showed me, and I just kept on drawing that head of Popeye forever. Until finally I was able to pull a couple of other things in that I was uh, drawing. My big thing was, it was drawing and reading. When I was a kid, I taught myself how to read by reading big little books. They had variations of what they called big little books that, were, that started in the 30s text and pictures, or else it was a uh, reprint in black and white of um, the newspaper strips. And of course, there was a lot of Tarzan and so forth. And I just, once I saw that, I just couldn't get enough of it. Uh, in fact, to this day, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I stayed in comics all my life. A lot of guys I know jumped into advertising. They were my contemporaries and my close friends. I didn't go. I preferred doing comics. I loved doing comics. I didn't want to do advertising. I brought a kind of stupid integrity <laughs> with me. It was my only passion. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to tell a story. And I wanted to be able to draw it beautifully if I could. And, uh, but a lot of guys came into this business during the end of the Depression because they couldn't get work in art agencies or whatever. And they came into comics. Comics was a low paying field, but at least there was work available. And all the early guys were essentially people who would never have come into comics ordinarily. They would have gone right into advertising or into some sort of illustration, you know, editorial illustration. And, uh, but I never wanted that. I just wanted comics. I mean, I grew up on them. I started working when I was 16. I had my first professional job. And, uh, uh, and I just ate the stuff. I became encyclopedic about it. I mean, I knew everything about it. And, uh, or at least I thought I did, and uh, little by little, you know, I started to climb over the carcasses of the older, less apt <laughs> artists who were in the field, who, uh, you know, I, I sort of I caught on to them and crawled over them and then finally passed them, you know, on the chain up the, uh, you know, uh, up the ladder, trying to get to a position of, um, of professionalism. And um, the field lost a lot of people in the very beginning. And it finally developed a class of people that I was typical of. The person who wanted to be a comic book artist right from the start, who read comics as a child. I came in at the end of the first generation of comic book artists who were outside of comics. They came in from outside of comics. And then I became that what they call the Silver Age, that age of cartoonists who were trained to do it and nothing else, you know. And uh, we built our whole skills on learning to become uh, better artists, making the trip from Popeye to uh, Terry and the Pirates and, you know, learning all of the necessary skills along the way to try to get near, you know, that, that level of excellence that Kniff represented.
and it was a um, it was just constant learning and education and uh, everything that I ever valued in my life came as a result of it everything every bit of taste I ever de developed came out of my need to know my need to make know and judge that's what I wanted to know I wanted to know how to make, know, and judge. Do you think um, uh, that sort of uh, that might explain why that was sort of there was sort of an explosion of creativity in the Soviet Oh age? yeah, right. Yeah, I would say it was restrained primarily by uh, uh, by the publishers. I mean, there are always uh, you know a million ideas zooming around, but uh, you know. Um, Little by little, they got to the point, you know, it was big business. They would just read what sold best. What sold best was duplicated. What didn't sell best was eliminated. And so and that became the basis for the field. And um, they tried everything. They tried Westerns. They tried true confessions. They tried gangster stuff. You know, crime, not, crime does not pay. During the uh, early 40s, outsold Superman and Captain Marvel used to sell over a million copies per issue per month. Can you imagine the, the profit margin on that, even without ads? So they tried everything, and everything in turn was ultimately, you know, worked into the ground or else they had no way of sustaining the interest in it or exploring its possibilities beyond what they, you know, what they did immediately. So then they'd move on to something else. And for a while, it was always something else. When the uh, uh, crime books died, ultimately, romance, true confessions came in. And they were, I would say, for about 20 years, they represented for some companies their highest income. They outsold everything else. And they developed a certain style, certain artists were more suited to it. And when they were more suited to it, they followed the natural line that they were being led in. You, you understand there was a, a direction that uh, romance comics followed. And in order to keep refining your work, you automatically followed it. So your work developed in a certain way. and. Uh, uh, or if you were like me, and uh, primarily I did everything, but uh, the thing that I was best at was action. So uh, as much as possible, I, uh, I kept refining my action, refining my picture making and studying, you know, the, the big geniuses of the field like Roy Crane and Milton Kniff and Old Sickles and Hal Foster. And um, it, uh, in fact, everybody I ever saw was an influence on me. Had to be. I mean, it was my whole world. And uh, ultimately, I became professional. That is, I achieved a level of competence that, uh, you know, that I recognized and that the publishers recognized. But, you know, competence doesn't mean, uh, you know, excellence. Competence merely means you can do the job. Uh, do you want to take a break for a second? Yeah, I'm fine. I just got something in my throat. Oh, I noticed you. Uh, yeah. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, you mentioned you worked in just about every um, every genre. Um, yeah. Did you have a favorite genre you like to work in? Oh, sure. I, well, actually, as it turns out, I like... My favorite reading matter happens to be epic material. I love Greek tragedy. Uh, to me, the Authorian legend is a Bible. And uh, I love epic material. Not action material per se, but epic material. Material where there is profound loss and against a kind of primitive background. That to me is paradise. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't. I can't find anyone who might be interested in uh, you know in doing that with stuff because anything that they've done like that. By like that, I mean just taking superficially uh, 
its most obvious elements, like a sword plate, you know, like Conan and so on and so forth, they've run through that cycle and they don't see any possibility beyond that cycle. And there may not be a possibility in terms of mass, com mass comic book publishing, but, you know, Arthurian novels occur several times a year continuously and have for just this entire century. In fact, I turned one out myself. And uh, so what I'm saying is that um, that would have been, that, yes, by and large, without any exception, uh, that, uh, that would be my, uh, my favorite. That would be my choice to, uh, to do something like that. I was never a big fan of, um, of uh, what's his name, um, who, who wrote those three or four novels starting with The Hobbit? Tolkien. Tolkien. Yeah. I was never a big fan of Tolkien. Uh, it, it seemed to me too casual. It, and uh, yet, God knows, it became, uh, for about 25 years there. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, what I prefer was uh, Homeric and Arthurian. I, um, the, the sense of tragedy and wisdom in that material and, and lyric beauty is such that I don't find it anywhere else. And uh, that's, uh, as I say, that, uh, that would have been my preferred choice. In terms of uh, the, uh, oh, should I do the three whole percent? Three. We'll just take a short uh, break while they clear the hallway. Yeah, no problem. My boy, don't be so apologetic. It's okay. Okay, we're okay? Okay. Um, uh, can we talk a little bit about um, uh, the uh, material that was uh, happening at DC, um, say from, I'd say the reintroduction of the old characters, the revamping, the redesigning of characters? Like yeah, right. Well, what happened was, of course, is that DC became the most successful company. And they had, and in the beginning, after Superman, Immediately they had Batman, and they had Wonder Woman, and uh, they had a bunch of subsidiary characters, and, but more than that, they were also brilliantly managed. So they bought paper plants and newspapers and distribution companies. I mean, they were just, you know, a, a really smart organization. Uh, as I say, brilliantly managed. And uh, uh, what happened was that by 19, the end of the uh, uh, 40s, the string had run out on all their old characters. They couldn't sell them, so they replaced them immediately with Western characters, as I told you. And they simply reflected the taste of the day uh, you couldn't go into a movie theater without having, the chances are the picture was a Western. And uh, so they simply reflected, but they reflected it without managing somehow to catch, you know, like the fire in a bottle. So their, their sales began to lag. They introduced true adventure stories, which was... They were, that was introduced during the war when they were war heroes and so on and so forth. And they would turn out these uh, so-called true comics. Those lasted for a little while and then they flopped by the 40s as well. And um, ultimately the thing that came to the rescue was um, uh, romance. And then in 1959, after about 10 years where romance did most of the work, Superman still sold, Batman still sold, and they were sort of unchanged, just being diminished year by year and by, through repetition and through the fact that it, there was no freshness to the art or anything else. 
1959, I think it was, or 58, they decided to turn out the Flash all over again in a new situation. They had a magazine called Showcase, which they had been using to showcase titles, but essentially they showcased titles that were not, you know, strikingly original, but there hadn't been a return to superheroes in 10 or 11 years. The sales were uh, excellent. So they turned out three issues of Showcase, converted the book immediately into a regular monthly title, and the book was very, very successful. So they decided to try it again. They did that with uh, Green Lantern. The same process happened. The same thing went on, and um, it also became a successful book. So little by little, they began to take chances and sort of update their characters. You know, for a while, Superman couldn't be drawn in anything except certain official positions. He used to fly in the air as though he were running. It was, and these were all sort of uh, figures that were established early on. And again, it proves my point that all the artists who followed them simply traced or copied those figures rigidly. If they introduced a new Superman figure in action, they would be questioned because it was not typical. But since essentially the work was done by one or two artists who understood the restrictions, understood the venue and, and, and everything else, uh, Superman stayed the same from about the end of the war until about, uh, as I say, uh, the late 1950s when they began to take chances and uh, uh, replace some of the artists. Ultimately, they replaced uh, uh, the original creators on um, uh, Batman. Of course, Superman had the original creators replaced when they sued the company. Uh, and um, so that there was a, uh, a uh, you know, a, a different perspective. And the perspective was primarily keeping up with the, uh, with the times. I mean, that's what they were doing. They didn't get ahead of it ever. They never got into a situation where they would have a million dollar, a million copy selling comic book, you know, which would suggest some sort of breakthrough. They would have successful comics, which um, would reflect the times. They would have a run. And then after, uh, depending on how successful they were, when they started to fail, they would be dropped and replaced with something else. That began the situation until the 60s, when all of a sudden Marvel Comics came in with a genuine reflection of the times, mock irreverence, rebellion, a certain radicalism, especially in a, in a comic book, and they won the day for 30 years. <laughs> and um, it ultimately, it became an incestuous situation. DC never did catch on. So what they did ultimately is they began to interchange creative people by price, you know, by paying more, by doing this, by doing that, until ultimately both companies reflected essentially the same value. The only thing is Marvel was freer. They were free with their artists, and they were free with their writers. So as a result, I always feel it allowed that idiosyncratic element. As little as there was, it allowed it to show more than it did at DC. At DC, there was a more rigid control all of the time, even with the same people, you know. So uh, what happened was that uh, Marvel, and once they got into a certain momentum over these characters, it's not that they were so much better, it's just that they became the name. If it was a Marvel book, 
people wanted it, they sought it out, and so forth. And that's the way it was for about 30, even 35 years. You, you uh, were um, working at Marvel in the oh, yeah. late 60s? I worked there from the mid-60s. Actually, I worked there through all the years. My first job was during the 40s. I worked there uh, during the 50s, but always intermittently. But in the mid-60s, I started to do a lot of work for them. And by the early 70s, by the late 60s and the 70s, I was doing most of my work for them. I became their chief cover artist, and um, uh, I did virtually everything. I remember that. I remember Spider-Man, Avengers, Iron Fist, Conan. Name it. And we created a lot of that stuff, too. Yeah. Created Iron Fist, created Warlock, created all of those characters. And we didn't have anybody to tell us not to do it, I mean, uh, or to restrain, to restrain us. Roy Thomas was my collaborator. He was the uh, editor on the material on the stand. And the two of us would resurrect King Kong in a Spider-Man story. We would do uh, stories adapted from uh, the Immaculate Conception for Spider-Man. And uh, no, what was it, Spider-Man? No, it was for Warlock. And um, <coughs> we would just, whatever our fancy was, it's not that they were great stories, but we, we were having fun and it, there was a spontaneity to the material that I never saw my own work at DC. So uh, uh, I, that was the great advantage. And it, again, it, it just bears, up, bears my point that if you have to have a certain amount, you have to encourage those qualities in people that represent, you know, their singular, their, their most idiosyncratic qualities. Which seems to account for Marvel's success. Right. And uh, I think it'll account for practically any success that's likely to come along. You don't have to be at a left field. You just have to be a fresh version of what's currently happening. It's just that by bringing something up to date, you automatically make it brand new. It's, uh, I mean, for years, Westerns in the movies consisted of Zane Grey novels, and uh, I won't even talk about the, 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 the deep pictures John Wayne movies that were done, you know, within two or three days by some shoestring producer. But Westerns generally, so they're either epic, because Cecil B. DeMille would turn out Wild Bill Hickok, or, the, you know, I mean, he would make epic westerns. But the material was still all pulp, you know. But by the, after the war, uh, pulp magazines were writing good westerns. I mean, the Russians were very skilled, and the writers were very skilled, and they were writing westerns full of character. So they, in fact, Stagecoach, which John Ford did, was written by one of my favorite writers, Ernest Haycox, who was one of the, the best of the character writers, you know, of Westerns. So they, they introduced and immediately it took hold. Westerns became filled with character and so on and so forth and made a big difference from those shoot 'em up things that they were doing during the 30s and uh, the early 40s. And that was bringing it up to date. That's what the writers were doing. And it's like science fiction. Up until the time that, uh, what was Lucas's, Star Wars came out. The idea of a science fiction movie that was anything like a science fiction novel was, it was an impossibility. I mean, it was like Flash Gordon working out of a little toy model, you know, spritzing some smoke behind it. But with Star Wars, he created hardware. He created ships that looked like, you know, space-going freighters. There was some sense of what was happening in science fiction, even though they were behind the writing anyhow. The fact is that they managed to bring it up a whole generation, two generations, to a 
point where you know there was a certain amount of credibility in it and uh, that's why I think that uh, you know comics may survive it just has to be brought up to date in terms of its marketing possibilities and it's uh, you know um, and in the way that it's done and reflect the yeah the singularity in other words it can't be mass produced mass produced they've run into an abutment they've run into a dead end with mass produced and uh, that's like children's books children's books are less mass produced than other books and um, that's why they survive they, they have a quality of change and surprise and you know and so on and so forth and they're always up to date somebody is always writing about something that kids who are just three and four years old recognize as being something familiar you know so um, yeah I think uh, recognizing you know the, the, the age you live in and being able to take your work professionally and reflect what's going on even superficially is to give the work a freshness and because most work just gets stale it just gets stale and, and you know molders and uh, gets to be 25 and 50 years old and uh, has to be thrown out like a like an, uh, an old stale piece of bread Oh yeah, Morbius is based on Jack Palance. We needed a, uh, I wanted to do a vampire character and I figured Jack Palance, that's the perfect guy. <laughs> and uh, we did, that's when we were having a lot of fun with the material. I mean, they didn't put limits on us. There, uh, we, so we, I modeled him on Jack Palance. There's a strip, we created a character called Iron Fist. Iron Fist was modeled after one of the most influential strips to me it's not that it was the greatest it's just once I saw it it became the template for nearly everything I ever did and it was called Amazing Man by an artist named Bill Everett who ultimately did the Submariner and the Amazing Man to me when I used to gobble it up every month was so perfect there was a credibility in it for me. I worked it into every strip I ever did from that point on. Every strip that I had to create had some element of the Amazing Man story in it. And uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, I was that way with, uh, with horses too. I, uh, I stumbled across an artist named Dean. I can't forget his, I can't remember his first name. He did King of the Royal Mounted for King Feature Syndicate way back in 1936. And he must have been a pulp artist, Alan Dean. And when I saw his horses, which their arched necks and the manes, you know, just flowing and the tail up and arced, and the rhythm of the leg, he obviously knew the running pattern of uh, the horses. And I never forgot that in my whole life. I've never drawn a horse since that time that didn't incorporate those elements as much as possible in, a, in, a, uh, in an animal's figure. And uh, that's why I say to me, uh, when I look at that stuff and I realize the impact it had on my personality as an artist, as a creator, uh, 
it's my, it, you know, it's, uh, it's like the pattern of my life. Uh, you go to a movie and you see the miracle of Fred Astaire in movie after movie, flawless, perfect, brilliant, singing, flawless, perfect, brilliant music. I mean, how could it not stay with you? How could you not leap out of that theater, you know, want to, uh, especially as a kid? I mean, I was enormously impressed by the things that I saw and felt and experienced during my, uh, you know, during the time that I was growing up. And everything I've ever tried to do in my work is a reflection of that to the extent that I was capable of doing it. Uh, I mean, there are some guys in this field who are just sensational, naturals. They were better than I was after I got to be competent. They were competent when they started. On top of that, they put in years of intensive effort. You can imagine the level that they put themselves at. But they did comics, you know, and uh, so there was very little appreciation for a piece of work. There was an artist, an illustrator named Harry Beckman, who worked for the Saturday Evening Post and Colliers and Liberty. So I admired his work. It was very simple style. And then another artist about five or eight years ago showed me an ex a sample of his work. And it was done almost the size, I would say, it was smaller than the size of a postcard. The drawing was so flawless. To this day, I have to, I'm in awe that anyone could have such economy, such brilliance. It was the most outstanding display of drawing I ever saw. Hardly anybody knows about him, except maybe other illustrators. He died a long time ago. And uh, yet, people hold up other people as icons who aren't one-tenth, one-hundredth as good, you know? That's another thing. It's like writing. I mean, uh, editors are editors. But you know that some editors are better than others. Some editors actually can perceive the quality of a work. And some editors are just readers. And that's what it is with uh, a lot of uh, artists who I know who are both artists and editors. And that is, it's very hard for them to perceive a lot of the qualities that are so subtle and built into the work. Enough to floor me, but they are totally indifferent. They don't see it at all. Well, um, I mean, time, I guess, sorts out these things, you know. Uh, um, it takes a while sometimes for certain things to be recognized. Uh, we, uh, I, um, my sense has always been, just as you were influenced by the movies and you remember yeah. these things, um, for me, it's comic books, the comic books of, that I grew up with and the comic books you did that inspired me to make movies today. And that's sort of the source of my imagination, was the work that I read as a kid. And I think that's reflected now. I think there's a visual sense and a, an imaginative sense that came out of all that work. I don't think it could have been Star Wars no. without Superman, Batman. Oh, Batman. well, there's no question about it. And a lot of the work coming out of Hollywood, the look of it, the visual look, um, Tim Burton's films, the art direction, it all came from comic books. Oh, yes, and as a matter of fact, uh, I met a number of uh, the directors out there, and as a matter of fact, they all knew who I was, which surprised me. And, uh, right, and uh, they, uh, you know, uh, they, would, they would talk about, it. you know, I tell you, we were lucky. When I was a kid, for instance, I mean, I grew up in Brooklyn, in Brownsville. The only other distinguished figure to come out of Brownsville, I'm sorry, okay, was uh, Alfred Kazin and maybe Dutch Schultz, the gangster. I'm not sure whether um, 
Pete Hamill came out of Brownsville or not, I don't know. In any case, uh, the point is it was a really, you know, I mean, it's a poor depression area. But uh, God, you know, I mean, uh, when I used to see a stare in pictures, I became, in and, I, and then I used to see, um, you know, uh, Flynn or somebody uh, doing um, uh, Robin Hood or any of those things. I became, I was very interested, I was always very athletic, but I became interested in gymnastics. But I was too big to really, you know, do anything, be anything, uh, to achieve anything in, in gymnastics. But w during, when I came out of the army, army, I found the ballet. And I used to go to the Metropolitan Opera or to the city center. I would see their entire setup. I mean, I used to see all of the uh, dances, ballet theater played uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Metropolitan Opera. They had a, uh, a roster of dance stars, Egalevsky and so on. And, uh, but they had their, I mean, a full roster of, uh, of choreographers. They had Agnes DeMille, they had uh, Anthony Tudor, they had, everybody was working at the time. I also used to see, uh, you know, Balanchine over at uh, City Center. And of course, I used to see Jerome Robbins. In fact, I even saw Jerome Robbins dance in his own Age of Anxiety. And uh, so, I mean, it was always important for me to have my characters, power and grace, were the two elements I always wanted in my work, consciously. And if I could dip a toe, <laughs> I always did it, just for the line quality. And I got that entirely out of watching uh, dancing and being a big fan of gymnastics and uh, ultimately becoming a fan of, uh, of Gene Kelly's, but I became disillusioned with Kelly. But uh, I mean, because there were so many better dancers. The only thing is that, uh, but I was so aware of, you know, of power and grace, power and grace. And that's why I loved drawing horses and manes and snorting nostrils and, you know, all of the things that suggested energy and fire and uh, and I wasn't always smart enough to be aware consciously aware that that's what I wanted to get into my stuff I had to I, I was sort of blind and groping and had to work intuitively a lot and I uh, I would have done better if I had some formal training a lot better when you uh, work in a different genre or when you would take over strip would you um one that I'm thinking of is Conan, uh, where Barry Smith's art was almost Baroque. And then yeah. yours, again, had that same quality, it was power and energy. Um, did you, uh, how did you approach that? Well, first of all, Conan, I was going to do Conan as a sister book to a self-published magazine called His Name is Savage, which I published and which was, as far as I know, the first complete graphic novel, that is, of original material. It had original material and it ran for 44 pages, which was uh, the length of the magazine. It was an unmitigated failure, but uh, I had high hopes for another magazine to replace it. That was going to be Conan because the publisher of the Conan material lived in my neighborhood. And I'd already been negotiating with him to do it. As it turned out, I was finally in a situation where I couldn't do it. And then, of course, um, it became, uh, Marvel decided to do it. And um, so when, when uh, finally I, I was, uh, I, I did some of the covers during uh, Barry uh, Smith's uh, tenure. But um, after he left, uh, issue 16, I think it was, I did several issues. And I just felt, you know, completely at home with the character the way I would have done it if I had done it right from scratch. It just so happened I once read <laughs> Barry Smith in a monograph and he said the two big influences in his life were Gustav Doré and Gil Kane. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, I really didn't have that big a problem. And uh, 
anyway, but uh, that's, yeah, that's, it's, you know, you try to bring your qualities to it. Sometimes you come to a situation which is superior to yours. I mean, you find, you know, you're doing the work of an, I once did Prince Valiant when the artist who was doing it, John Cullen Murphy, he was the second artist to do it, broke his leg. So he asked me to step in for a few weeks. So I drew it, I penciled it. And uh, I must tell you, I, uh, I mean, I, I did it at the rate of about a page a day, which, you know, it's incredible. But the point is that I, uh, I worked hard at it. I mean, I, I tried to do the best that I could because the work required a level of effort superior to what I usually gave. In fact, it required a level of effort superior to what I could give, you know? So I tried to, I just try to approach it the best I could, carrying forward the, the, uh, the taste, the, uh, you know, what I felt would have been the, uh, uh, you know, um, the choices of uh, the original material. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I just try to, to, to do a good job of counterfeiting. But uh, Foster's work, in my estimation, represents one of the three levels or one of the three artists in this business who represents the absolute, like Ella Fitzgerald, <laughs> no second place. The other one would be Roy Crane, no second place. And Milton Kniff, who wasn't as good an artist as uh, Noel Sickles, who was his mentor and who gave, who in effect uh, helped develop his style. But Noel Sickles' stuff was always stillborn. And Kniff's stuff was so full of life and vitality and a fierceness that there's no contest in my mind. Kniff was the third. They all wrote and drew their own stuff. And uh, no second places for any of those guys. Um, one last question. And just um, uh, briefly, um, I just wondered if you could talk for a few minutes about Jack Kirby and your relation with uh, Well, J Jack Kirby, when Eisner had introduced, Eisner had ran an agency called Eisner and Iger, where they had the artists who worked for them. They went out and got the work, took a percentage, and then paid the artists who actually did it. Artist, Eisner himself, however, was one of the contributing artists. I mean, he wasn't simply a, uh, you know, a, a boss handing out work. He was uh, seated alongside with them and did uh, work of a fairly good quality, uh, you know, along with them. But the thing is that they were working, they were doing work based on the style, essentially, of either newspaper strips or illustrators and magazines. You could see Lion Decker and you could see Rockwell and you can see you know, Kniff and uh, uh, Foster and all, you could see all these guys represented the material. Jack came along and did a strip called Blue Bolt. It was so galvanizing in the action. First of all, most characters are so two-dimensional that you can actually slip the drawing under the door. I mean, you don't feel that there's a 180, 200 pound man in that drawing. Jack's characters looked like they weighed 200 pounds. I mean, they were so full of muscle and sinew and raw and powerful and spontaneous that they, he did eight issues or nine issues of this Blue Vault and he and his partner, Joe Simon, but Jack is the artist, they went over and they created Captain America. And with Captain America, his style was so free and so powerful, and all the other characters he touched that he wiped out 
all of the other guys who were doing superheroes before him, it became the style. Everybody who had a tickle style, a careful style, an academic style, they were all eliminated by the sheer force. And his force was like Picasso. It was a combination of the very modern, raw, unsubtle, and the primitive, in that it was so bold, nothing could stand before it as superhero material. And while the superheroes lasted, Jack and his partner were kings of the world. When the superhero stuff died, <coughs> Jack had to go into romance material. It was successful, but it was not Jack, something of, for me, Jack's material, his romance material always looked kind of lurid. You know, it didn't have that leaning into the wind, delicate quality. But when the, in fact, Jack was having a, um, a difficult job finding a real place for himself in the changing scheme of comics. He tried classic comics and that didn't work out. Uh, and then he came back to Marvel and they started doing monster stuff and they came back to the superhero. They were a small company, so as a result, Stan had to allow the maximum amount of freedom. He wrote everything, but he couldn't write everything. So what he let the artist do is he let the artist make up the plots, talk it over with him, and then go home and draw it, and bring him the finished story completely drawn out, where all he'd have to do is go home and fill in the copy. He'd do that in one night which was pretty remarkable. And, he had a, and, he, and it was a nice quality for that time. But that's the way it worked. So as a result, you can see how much flexibility the artist had himself. I mean, uh, he couldn't afford to give you a script that was written out and that in effect allowed you few options. This way, you had all the options in the world. So Jack's early stuff was 90% fight scenes. 90% fight scenes and 90% new characters, which Jack was very good at. And that's the way it was for the first couple of years. Fights, in fact, they became famous for their fight scenes, especially compared to DC, where there weren't any fight scenes at all. <clears throat> um, would you say that uh, Jack Kirby was an influence on, on your style? Oh, sure. I, I worked for him when I was so uh, 17 years old, Jack and Joe, Simon, his partner, were getting ready to go into service. They had a, a, a contract with DC, and they were doing four books for them. That is, they, they were doing characters in each of four books. The Boy Commandos, Sandman, Manhunter, and the Newsboy Legion. I was sent over by a friend of theirs, John Beardsley, when I came up there, they wanted to know if I could copy their stuff, which I could because Jack was one of my favorite artists. <coughs> and what happened was that uh, they said, okay, and they gave me scripts. They gave me Newsboy Legion scripts. They gave me, and what they did was they let me draw the script except for the splash. They would draw the splash they would have an inker come in and ink the whole thing, and they would pass it in as part of their quota. They were just trying to build up as much quota as possible. And uh, that's what I did for about uh, six months or so until Joe went to service first, joined the Coast Guard, and Jack was drafted into the Army during the summer. When Jack was dra drafted, uh, drafted into the army, DC kicked me out. <laughs> so, and that was the end of my uh, my excellent adventure as uh, as a Jack Kirby. Uh, that's why I and I oh of course I always loved his stuff, loved it. For myself, I needed here's the peculiar part. Ultimately, I came to we went to live in Los Angeles, and I got a job working for Ruby Spears which was an arm of Hanna-Barbera. Uh, 
Jack was on the staff. And what Jack did were, were pre presentations. In other words, he would take a board about the size of that board up there, 20 by 30. They would tell him what they wanted in terms of this idea they had about a program. And he would do drawings. In other words, he would do each drawing would be 20 by 30 and represent what the program was going to look like. By the time I got there, Jack had already been working there for five years. And what they liked about my work was that it was so much like Jack's. But what they also liked about my work was that it, had, it was more representational. So that I had a much wider span that uh, so Ultimately, I worked there for five years. And uh, Jack and I were the last two employees to be let go when they finally went out of business. And uh, I used to see Jack uh, occasionally, but um, uh, Jack, uh, you know, Jack had a lot of supporters. In fact, uh, his friends are devoted to him or to his memory they they deified him then and uh they uh, they deify him now i thought that jack was the probably the best in what he brought into the field it's just that there were qualities in other artists that were also excellent excellent and it's that discounting that bothers me. Mm. Guys who I thought in ways could do better. In some, some respects, they couldn't do anywhere near as well. In Jack's great strengths, nobody could touch him. But there were other areas where Jack wasn't as strong, where other guys were simply superb. And that simply accounts for the way that styles change depending on what was the taste of the day, whether it was romance, whether it was superhero, whether it was representational stuff where guys had to learn how to do folds and realistic figures and crime does not pay. I mean, people developed a, a variety of styles and approaches and the, the styles that were most natural to them, obviously, were the ones that were developed, uh, you know, further and, you know, superbly. So that there were a lot of really first-rate guys in this field and uh, but nobody dominated the field like Jack did for the you know the earlier superhero run and then finally the other superhero run but there are people I mean uh, like uh, Eisner whose early work still ha resonates I mean it's still an influence on a lot of the artists and then later on during the 50s Harvey Kurtzman, whose work was sort of a very sophistic, sophisticated a, sort of assimilation of all of the earlier techniques into a beautiful visual literary uh, treat. And I think that the comic books that Harvey did brought to bear literary values that I'd never seen in comics before. And uh, that about sums it up. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to have a lot of trouble, you know, as uh, paper prices go up and printing costs go up and readership goes down, you know. So well, this is where I came in. <laughs> There are, really, I mean, uh, I also think that not taking on a panel, doing it individually this way, 
that you'll get a better perspective. You'll really get a, uh, a more genuine, nobody will be uh, sort of couching their language, you know, in any special way, but giving you a, uh, a real sense of, of what their own experience was. And, uh, and like I say, the only thing that I can't see is, I mean, I, it, I've worked so hard all my life and I, I just can't stand when people don't understand how hard I've worked. I mean, I don't expect people to say the work is any good or that we appreciate it or anything, but... Well, you get it when we go to conventions. Or well, we I don't... Conventions. See, now, I don't expect anything from fans. I, well, I don't think fans know what they're talking about. But you get something from fans. I mean, these are people that come up and they bring their kids, their people that are in the Oh, well, I mean, they've gotten something from and the work. They will come up to him and say, you know what attracted us is, is the, uh, the quality, the, uh, the grace in the... Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, well, once in a while I get that. But essentially, I don't expect them. How could they? I spend seven days a week looking and studying the material. After 60 years, 65 years of studying and looking, I mean, I have some insights into it. And I've also done a great deal of reading, you know, to, to, to help enlighten and to give me language to express my point of view about some of the material. When you don't have language, you don't know what you're saying. I mean, in order to describe something, you have to have the language to, to do it. When you have the language to do it, you know, you know what you're saying. In other words, uh, I know that until I have conversations with a lot of friends of mine, very often in the course of conversation, they'll say something and I'll say, gee, I never thought of that. They never thought of it either. It's just that with the ability to articulate, an idea all of a sudden becomes whole, you, know, you understand? And um, I think that uh, this is hard work, I mean, uh, and, uh, and it's not great paying work. And uh, I was a shmeel for, uh, I mean, the, the material war, rewards in this business, they're okay, I mean, uh, I, I did all right, I, you know, but Jesus, I could have done ten times better anywhere else. I mean, anywhere can. All you had to do is just go into advertising, and uh, you would, you'd, you'd come away with uh, lifetime benefits and pension plans and so on and so forth and so forth. I mean, uh, none of the things comics didn't give you. On comics, you were on your own. You were a free. Lancer. You are still a freelancer. After working for DC for over 50 years, I am their oldest employee in terms of time. I'm still a freelancer who's treated like any casual freelancer without any special privilege or advantage, while the people who are on staff who were hired two weeks ago get two-week vacations, three-week vacations. They get the whole variety of benefits that a salary job, you know, brings. So what I'm saying is, while this is my choice, the fact is that uh, this business could have been something other than it is in terms of, uh, you know, they try to form a union three or four times in comics never succeeded yeah and uh, and uh, much to the publisher's delight so as I say I mean uh, the, even the animators for Christ's sakes even musicians who's more whacked out of their heads than musicians <laughs> why, why couldn't the comic book business form a union because it's a bunch of insecure we all work, work alone in music you work Always you work with somebody else. There's a sense of involvement and teamwork and so on and so forth. In this goddamn business, it's like being a writer. You're just isolated until you bring your work in. Not only that, but you're isolated from other guys who are in direct competition with you. They don't work with you. They work to compete with you. And the 
publisher constantly pushes the competition between you. So the thing is, it could have been anyway, but what they would do is the minute they'd hear that there was a uh, talk about a union developing, they would go in and offer key people, the people who we depended on to be, you know, the voices for the industry, they would immediately capitulate, take the higher rate, keep their mouths shut, and duck out. It's like when, uh, when Keith Alvis started to investigate comic books. Now, none of us were doing pornography, none of us. We weren't even doing anything more violent than what you saw in Prince Valiant or Tarzan or Terry and the Pirates or anything like that. And we were just, it was just comic books. When the Key Fava Committee came in, the very top guys in syndicates say, we don't have anything to do with that. They're in one business, we're in another business. They totally broke the connection. They didn't want to be swamped. They didn't want to be tainted. They didn't want to be contaminated by the fact that we're cartoonists also. As good as they were. Some, in some cases, better. When, so, when he did his name is Savage, so he had, you know, uh, printers and distributors all arranged, and the big companies came in, because at that time... They that time they had the comics code. You couldn't publish a comic book without the comics code, and no printer would print a comic book unless it had a comics code. Really? Yes, so it was like a Cattlemen's Protective Association. So when they heard that I was going to turn on a comic book, they went to their printer, who does all the, who did all the comic books, Spartan. You remember when Spartan, uh, uh, Illinois was the, uh, the, the heart, all the comics were published by Spartan, Sparta, I don't know what Spartan. And uh, they told them that we were publishing pornography. We, they immediately dropped us. We went to three more printers who were printing and they dropped us. We finally found the guys who were doing, not Rolling Stone, Ramparts. <laughs> Ramparts magazine, they didn't give a crap. So they, uh, they printed us. But once we were printed, Nobody did just wanted to distribute us. Most of it never left. The, the yeah, house. right. We were we had two hundred thousand copies in boxes, only twenty thousand of which were opened. Is that the one with the Lee Marvel? Yeah, that's the baby. That. Yeah, yeah, right. They, it was only they wouldn't distribute it. Really? Because they, the company said if you distribute this. Yeah, that, now if I had a piece of mail, us. if I had a letter, if I had something, I would be living in a penthouse somewhere because I would have sued their asses. But I didn't have anything. They would but make phone calls and do it all, all with pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, local distributors, everybody fell into place. And we just couldn't get out. That's why Marvel, in order to stay in business, had to make a deal with DC in order to be distributed. They had their own distributing company called Atlas. They sold it. When they sold it, a lot of their books also failed. And so they, to all intents and purposes, for about six months, they were out of business. They made a deal with DC, who owned the largest distributing company, Independent News, to have seven titles distributed a month. That's all DC would allow them. And those titles originally were just all monster titles. I guess that's why Marvel, a lot of titles, yeah, a lot of titles are being canceled in that Right, right, and right. Well, also, they, even, you know, they only had the seven, the and they had to keep doing it. Came up, and, and Marvel started, you know, all this publishing, and they would tell the comic book stores, if you didn't take X amount of titles, we wouldn't give you anything. Yeah. We pushed everything else away. Well, the point, yeah, that's, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it's, I mean it's, it's a tough, you know, it tough. was a tough business run by uh, guys, you know. I mean, people who are in distri distribution are tough guys. I mean, distributors around the country are, uh, are you know, a lot of them are uh, rough guys, mob guys. Uh, but uh, they, uh, you know, that's, so what I'm saying is that being independent and idiosyncratic and singular 
is a miracle. And uh, because uh, when you think of what you've got to squeeze through in order just to stay alive, to be recognized, and then thought of as doing something worthwhile, you know, I mean, what gets through the net? You Nothing. Made too many waves. There was always another another artist, you know. Right, right. Another, well, another well, that was, uh, yeah. to, you know, what, where do you yeah, go from right. here? Right. Most of the guys I know left comics. Aside from everything else, I'm one of the oldest relics. Still working. <laughs> still working in comics. I don't do much, but I mean, I still work at it. But the point is that it's a uh, field where uh, most of the guys fell by the wayside, drifted into advertising, couldn't keep up with the, um, the skills of the new artists who were coming in, who stood on the shoulders of the generation before them, us, just the way we stood on the shoulders of the generation before us, and utilized you know, all of the formulations and put them to work and exceeded the guys who preceded us. And so many of the guys in my generation were, pre were ultimately exceeded because uh, these new guys came in, you know, already working at a level that took most of the older guys years to achieve. And you need to be very competitive. You need to be, you know, like he'll look at new work coming in. You know, we get the uh, DC sends out a carton every month of all, you know, the work that they're publishing. Mm -hmm. And he'll look at it and he'll say, I have to retire. It's, uh, it's, but I know that he'll talk that way. He'll talk that way, and then he'll begin to practice. No, and practice and I'm at a point now where I'm outliving my enthusiasm. <laughs> so you know, you need enthusiasm more than anything. You need enthusiasm. When years ago, my enthusiasm for most of the written material began to fall away, and you know, I stopped reading pulps as a basis for practically everything I was doing. And I started moving to, when I started reading the Arthurian legend and Homer and, you know, I started reading seriously, it became harder to do comics. I, it was hard to reconcile, because the one thing you have to do is you must have that enthusiasm that's part of being, I won't say immature, but it's, it's part of being unstoppable. You know, I mean, because, um, Otherwise, it's too hard to, uh, to do it. Uh, it's like being an actor. Uh, the, if you can take all the rejection you're going to get, then, you know, stay with it. But if you're sensitive to rejection, I mean, you know, being an actor or a writer, say, uh, it's a tough road to hoe because you're going to get a lot of it. And that's a lot of it because even if you're good, it takes a wise mind and a wise eye to recognize quality. Recognizing quality is the toughest goddamn thing. Even with people who have full authority, I wouldn't trust their judgment to buy me a Mars bar. I mean, it's, you have to know. I mean, they don't look at it like I look at it. They haven't worked as hard as I have at it. And, uh, a lot of the artists I know are insensitive to other artists who I think are superb, superb. And they say, well, yeah, he's all right. I mean, I like him, but uh, so I figured, like him. Why, that guy, what he, I mean, this guy does a miracle. Every time he sits down to work, they don't see it. I mean, they like other guys who are good, but they don't have that wider range or, you know, or that... Uh, subtle a balance for either picture making or action or composition or characterization or any of the things that you know that make a comic strip come alive and uh, you know actually be worthwhile people go by the most obvious judgment the obvious judgment being that anybody who works like Norman Rockwell and totally makes lifelike pictures is the best what's most lifelike is the best you know, I mean, uh, I think Norman Rockwell is excellent myself, but, you know, I mean, it's not because he's lifelike. Uh, anyway, my boy, I uh, hope uh, that uh, 